is now the third year George has been here. Um, and so I always tell students, look, you know, you can spend three days with George <laughs> actually in Seattle. So the Gilder Fellows, are, we're doing a separate uh, discussion, live discussion with them. Uh, but here in the morning, so the morning in Seattle for three hours, we're going to have a series of speakers. Most of the speakers are actually here together. So we realized since we can't, couldn't all join uh, together and have all the students here, at least some of the speakers could be together. So we're actually outfitted here in the, the small conference room in the Discovery Institute offices in Seattle. And uh, as we usually do, we're going to start with George Gilder. So again, let me just sort of briefly introduce George to you for those who don't know him, I suspect most of you do. Um, I've known George since I started actually at Discovery Institute in 1998 when I was five years old and came to, came to <laughs> Discovery uh, just out of graduate school, but had known George's work for years and had read his Wealth and Poverty actually right out of college uh, to great benefit um, and had actually read his book Money, My, uh, Men and Marriage years before and hadn't connected the dots. But George, of course, started out in what we might call sort of social theory and, and social philosophy and social studies uh, and then moved very much into economics and then in the last 25 years or so has been uh, heavily involved in futurism and technology. And so he's a prolific author. He is the co-founder of Discovery Institute with Bruce Chapman. Bruce Chapman and George are actually roommates at, at Harvard College many, many moons ago yeah. together. And so they, they uh, have a history that goes beyond Discovery Institute. And George wrote the original Wealth and Poverty. If I've got this right, George, you wrote it on a typewriter in Bruce's apartment, at least part of it, right? Here part Seattle. of it was in Bruce's apartment in downtown Seattle, yeah. so, uh, but, over a coffee shop down the street from the first Starbucks. Oh, right. So across from the Pike Place Pike Market. Place, Pike Place Market. That's right. So that's his where. <laughs> and then, then I moved to Vashon, oh, yeah. where I wrote a good deal of it in Vashon. That's but great. I also wrote a lot of it in Albany, New York, yeah. where I was uh, uh, I had just written Visible Man, yes. which was a story of post-racist America right. written in 1978. <laughs> You're way ahead of the curve. Yeah, way ahead of the curve. Well, we thought we would start this, this morning. So tomorrow we're going to talk about George's much more recent work and especially his uh, information theory of economics from Knowledge and Power and Life After Google. But we wanted to start this morning, actually, just with a consideration of wealth and poverty, which was written originally in the early 1980s and then uh, was reissued here a few years ago. But I honestly think it is as timely as ever. A, a, a robust defense of the free enterprise system is not the sort of greed of Ayn Rand, but uh, the altruism, the other directedness of the entrepreneur. So George, why don't you give us a kind of brief overview of sort of wealth and poverty 40 years later? Well, I, I like, here we are in the middle of what I believe is the greatest public policy blunder in the history of America or maybe any other country that's excluding war and yes. gigantic errors of this sort. But for pure policy, policy blunder, quarantining all the healthy people and locking down the economy as a remedy mm -hmm. for a new kind of flu yeah. is the greatest blunder in the history of public policy. Mm -hmm. So here we are in the middle of a depression and I encourage myself by the fact <laughs> that uh, Wealth and Poverty, which announced the end of socialism yep. and a new theory of capitalism, was written in the midst of the depression of the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as the prologue here, here wrote, uh, with Jimmy Carter waving limp white flags of national malaise, remember malaise? with hostages still held in Tehran, petroleum and gold prices issuing terrible yeah. alarms of scarcity and exhaustion. It was believed that mm -hmm. uh, we'd reached peak oil oh, yeah. and um, U.S. banks were uh, at a tremendous inverted yield curve, which always signals depression. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the Soviet Union was getting rich and it's oil wealth, uh, yeah. the peak oil prices. And John Kenneth Galbraith joined the CIA in acclaiming the robustness and fast growth of the astonishing Soviet economy. I declared in Wealth and Poverty that socialism is dead. And so uh, 
we've been through terrible times before yeah. is the point and uh, wealth and poverty showed uh, the real sources of of wealth in uh, human creativity the creativity of entrepreneurs and the image of their creator mm -hmm. and and that uh, showed that uh, contrary to what most people believe um, capitalism is governed less by greed than by altruism that and that uh, uh, capitalists have to be concerned first with the needs of others they got to be oriented toward the needs of others they got to forego consumption mm -hmm. Well, George, I mean, so why do you think this argument is so misunderstood? I mean, it seems like the sort of greed is good argument of the business person, the entrepreneur, that just, it, it doesn't ever want to die. And your mm -hmm. argument, it's kind of common sense that a good entrepreneur has got to anticipate the needs of others. Why is this, uh, uh, why does it seem to still fall in deaf ears? I, I believe that uh, it began with Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. I mean, Adam Smith was mimicking Isaac Newton a hundred years yeah. ago, before. Right. Uh, and launching a whole new theory of economics that was to be as predictive and deterministic as, as the, uh, Newton's theory yeah. of physics mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the gravity, the role of gravity in, uh, physics was played by greed or incentives mm -hmm. and, um, and rewards and punishments to a kind of homo economicus, as he was called. And right. The economic man is the agent that drives the economy. And, and, he, and uh, he's very like a figure in a Skinner box. Mm -hmm. uh, Skinner was the behavioralist uh, psychologist right. who believed that uh, human beings were just completely blank slates mm -hmm. that were moved by stimulus right. and response on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Outside stimulus and response. Exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, all economic models have this homo economicus at the center, this agent mm -hmm. responding to forces from outside. Okay. Uh, rewards and yep. punishments, carrots and sticks, and uh, and by depicting capitalism as an incentive system in all the economic models, uh, it encourages uh, the cartoon models to depict the capitalist. You know, if you're the greedier, the greedier you are, mm -hmm. the more you respond to incentives. So, well, of course, yeah. though, I would assume that wanting to create value is also an incentive. So your point's yeah. not that people don't respond to incentives. It's this idea that we can create a formal economic system that will predict all the sort yeah, of things that, that will happen. That's the key point. That right? is the key point. But all the same, I do uh, disparage the focus on incentives because mm -hmm. it's, uh, yes, the desire to create, the desire to do good for others, the desire, the imaginative desire to change the world, all these things mm -hmm. can be depicted as incentives, but that deprives incentive of its real meaning. Mm -hmm. And in economics, it really is an immediate response to a right. pattern of rewards and imp and punishment that you can in principle sort of formalize so that that you can formalize yeah. in mathematics and an equilibrium yeah. model of the economy and in which you don't actually have to have humans that's right, <laughs> right? so so you basically have ca as you've said capitalism without capitalists you that's know, right or, capitalism without capitalists i think was a chapter of wealth and poverty yes. or, or at least of spirit of enterprise the book that came yeah. up out after wealth and poverty. Well, and it, I, you know, I forget because I th I connect wealth and poverty with the the, sort of the Reagan revolution. And yeah, of course, yeah. he valued the book, and so it's tempting to read historically back into that and forget that. Well, in fact, when you wrote it, you were writing it at this period of malaise when yeah, yeah. you know er supposedly, as you said, the Soviet Union was on the ascendancy and we were on the decline. And yeah. so you wrote mm -hmm. this was quite. Um, it wasn't like you wrote it in the middle of the Reagan Revolution. No, I wrote yeah. it during the Carter malaise. <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, I got a letter from Ronald Reagan when one of the chapters was published in Harper's. Wow. And that was my first connection okay. to Ronald Reagan. Now, uh, Wealth and Poverty is having a new career. Yeah. It's just been published in China. No, that's right, of all things. That's right, because it's actually published in China by a Chinese publisher, right? But yeah, in China, yeah. in translation by a Chinese publisher after Life After Google was yes. named the best social science book published in China last year. So, so Life After Google. Life After Google is my new book. Yes, theater. and that was the thin edge of the wedge. Um, in terms yeah. of your, your works in China, right? Yeah, it's yeah, this yeah. most recent book, and yeah. then uh, now Wealth and Poverty has come yeah, out yeah. in China. Did that just happen? That when? happened six months ago. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, that's terrific. Well, so, I mean, so what are, do you have the same attitude now that you had in, you know, in 79, 1980? Yes, we're going through, as you said, the worst kind of policy decision maybe in history, mm -hmm. but yeah. I mean, does that mean we're done for? What do you, I mean, well, I, I, I'm uh, conceiving of a book Life After Capitalism. Okay. And uh, what is wrong with capitalism that it, as it's currently practiced yes. and currently understood? And, and I want to focus on uh, the sources of capitalism mm -hmm. in Karl Marx. Hmm. I mean, Karl yeah. Marx named capital. That's where we got the word. Yeah, we got the word from <laughs> and, the socialists. We and didn't, yeah. uh, Das Kapital. Uh, it yes. is, 1852 to 1900 or something, yeah. three big volumes that really define capitalism in kind of negative Absolutely. terms. And, and uh, I think we got to transcend it. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm from this pit of depression, I am launching uh, the information theory yes. of economics. And tomorrow I'm really going to expound it along with Gail Pooley, yes. who is a really brilliant uh, new figure in economics, yes. transforming all yep. economic numbers with an alignment Absolutely. with uh, information theory of capitalism. Well, and so everyone uh, is going to hear economics. actually from, from Gail later uh, this morning as a new discovery fellow uh, doing some, as George said, exciting work that's very much in this vein. I mean, I yep. noticed it, from wealth and poverty to life after Google, that the role of the human person has yeah. always been central yeah. to your work. And yeah. it seems from the outside, people would say, of course, that's what economics is about. It's yeah, about yeah. persons. So it sounds strange, but in fact, right, very often the human person yeah. isn't in center stage in economics. And, it's, and the other issue is whether resources are fundamentally abundant or mm -hmm. scarce. Right. And, uh, and uh, Gail shows that the more people, the bigger the population is, the more abundant the resources are. That uh, there's no sign of running out of any physical resources. Physical resources are essentially infinite. And uh, all the molecules and atoms of the universe. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, and there's they, a lot of those. <laughs> and there are a lot of those. Yeah. And so, the whole idea of running out of oil or running out of any of these things is just a delusional in itself. But the first time this has really been scientifically yeah. demonstrated and documented is in the beautiful development of time prices yes. by um, Gail Cooley and yeah. his colleague Marion Tupi. And, and they, they, they're doing just um, a an original and oh, transformative yeah. job. Absolutely. I, and, I, yeah, I couldn't and, agree. More. And consummating wealth yes. and poverty, which was certainly a pin to the abundance of right. resources. And of course, Julian and, Simon's famous uh, bet, public yeah, bet, yeah, 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 with yeah. Paul Ehrlich, which you know was a kind of an initial gesture in this point, yeah. this idea that no resources, for the most part are an interaction of human creativity and activity and purpose with yeah. some physical things. It's not just yeah, some stuff yeah. out here, right? Uh -huh. uh, and so this, I can, I can tell you from teaching college students that this is the most counterintuitive lesson, this yeah, idea yeah. that you can you end up with more resources with more people, right? Yeah, it takes, yeah. it, it takes a it kind of a Copernican revolution yeah. of yeah. thinking. And I really think we're having a Copernican revolution of thinking now. Yeah. And a real revitalization of capitalism, part through Pooley's work, which is uh, really important in, the, in 
demonstrating that particular yes. point statistically, historically, with really unimpeachable data. Oh, yeah. Well, so what do you think is wrong as a kind of precursor to this, this next project with capitalism as you're describing it? Is it this massive collusion of large economic actors with government? What is it exactly? Yeah, it's, it's really in the United States, I think, the Supreme Court, even a conservative Supreme yeah. Court, has utterly failed to um, restrict lawyers who are officers of the court, have special privileges mm -hmm. in the law from exploiting those special privileges to get rich, essentially, right. uh, by targeting big corporations with lawsuits. I mean, uh, thousands of hospitals, we're mm -hmm. going to come out of COVID and all the hospitals of the country are going to be sued. Yeah. Right. And this is, this is not a legitimate mm -hmm. exercise of the law. Right. This is, th this is a, an obvious egregious violation, mm -hmm. which, uh, the Supreme Court should address yeah. since Congress is full of lawyers. You have no hope for them <laughs> yeah. ever doing tort reform. Right. They talk about it every oh, year. Sure. But uh, this business of, of uh, just suing, suing deep pockets as, a mm -hmm. as the, one of the biggest businesses in America, it sustains the whole Democratic Party. And it is, and par parts yeah. of the Republican Party. Yes. And it's, it's, um, it's really uh, the cancer of capitalism. Mm. It's, uh, and so this has to be addressed mm -hmm. and we can, and it's, it's, and it's uh, now resulted in a shrinkage of the stock market. Mm -hmm. There are only half as many public companies in America as there was. There are many fewer business starts in the United yep. States than in China. Right. Uh, uh, there are uh, three times more initial public offerings in communist China <laughs> than in the United <laughs> States. And, and a big difference is the law, this interaction of some 300,000 laws, mm -hmm. this endless bramble of, yes. of spurious le legalism mm -hmm. and litigation that is uh, stifling American the American economy. So, so I think uh, this is a time to to uh, develop a theory of economics that applies to any economy, mm -hmm. which uh, escapes this uh, homo economicus, which uh, has, is psychologically bankrupt. They don't believe in right. in Skinner boxes and psychology no. anymore. But they survive only in, <laughs> yeah. in economic models, and uh, and and show what they can show what China's doing right, and what we're doing right, and mm -hmm. what we're doing wrong. Yeah. As, through information theory, which is the great theory of Claude Shannon yep. and John von Neumann and others that uh, is the foundation of the internet mm -hmm. and of the um, new cryptocosm, yes. the blockchain. And the don't new... steal your thunder from tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, That's okay. right. That's um, a, yeah, you, right. That, yeah it because I'm, I'm wondering, I want you to say a little bit before we take questions about the material of superstition. You talk about yeah. homo economicus, yeah. uh, but it's not, it's not just a, re a reduction of people to these kind of external incentives. It's also this reduction of persons yeah. created in the image of God to blind matter in motion, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that unfortunately, there's this kind of weird materialist physics envy also, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. in yeah. economics that I think that still divides this. And this was something that was, I think, profoundly important about your book, uh, is that it was it's so profoundly humanistic in the sense mm -hmm. that you, you know, you, you, yeah. you implicitly understood that human beings were more than that. And yeah. so, um, I mean, is there any hope of of casting off that. Well, I think I think it's the flat universe theory. Mm -hmm. It's just as stupid as the flat earth theory. Yeah. The flat universe says that there's nothing out there but physics and chemistry. And uh, 
increasingly as a discovery fellow Jim Tour yes. demonstrates, physics can't no. explain chemistry. And yeah. A chemistry can't explain biology. <laughs> no. uh, more informationally complex systems cannot be um, explained by less uh, complex systems. Yeah. And, and so there are, the materialist superstition is just going to be overthrown because of its failure to explain the world. Uh, yeah, it may, it, my, it may. It, it, um, AI is. Yeah. I, um, I've just written a monograph for the Discovery yeah. Institute called Gaming AI, and yeah. I show how AI cannot uh, think. Yeah. It cannot right. be a mind. No. And AI, uh, but it, nor can it destroy jobs. AI right. will create jobs. Oh, no, that's right. And you've written a yes, book about absolutely. this too. Your yeah. great book. So, <laughs> so we, uh, we're all aligned with our critique of the materialist superstition, the belief that human beings are merely material beings. There's yeah. no uh, transcendent element yeah. in humanity. And that same superstition also afflicts uh, the mechanistic economics that uh, began with Adam Smith, who was a theist and everything. Sure. But but Adam Smith uh, really had physics envy. He was mm -hmm. trying to create a model of the economy that uh, was as complete and predictive as Newtonian Isaac physics. Newton's yeah. physics. Which was itself not complete and, in and physics. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> sort of irony right, of the story. Right. Well, we're getting some questions, and so we've got um, a few minutes, actually. So I wanted to turn to questions from folks that are participating. Um, and so feel free to actually uh, send us questions and I'll pull these up actually uh, on Zoom and on Q&A. So, um, okay, so um, we've got a question here, George, and I'll, let me read it. Um, so this is a question about your information theory of economics, okay? So, um, so you, you've talked about, yeah, so there's a, some dis, uh, discussion, what happened to the effort in 2014 by Discovery Institute to develop a research project or team in developing some of this stuff. And then some of this actually, ha some of this has happened actually. Yeah. And so Discovery Institute has a uh, program on wealth and poverty, but we also have a new program, the Bradley Center uh, on Natural and Artificial Intelligence, which um, it was a sort of is a manifestation of that. The focus is specifically on the AI part. And then George's work uh, in the Center and, on and Wealth Pooley's and Poverty. And Pooley's work, yes. Gail Pooley. That's right. Is, and time prices are direct development That's right. of uh, the a core principle of uh, information theory economics, which is money is time. Exactly. Uh, and, yeah, um, so stay to the answer really is stay tuned. And, and so it's sort of a development. Um, yeah, and so please, uh, on, uh, if you're on the, the webinar, you can actually ask us a question in the Q&A function, all right? So we're not on a regular Zoom chat, but we're on, it's on a webinar. And so there's a little Q&A uh, button in which you can ask, uh, uh, ask us questions. And so uh, the, the research project, though, at Discovery, precisely because of the nature of information theory, uh, a research program can't be a formal model in this, the same point. I mean, that's the sort of question, George, is, okay, so is the information theory of economics another formal model? Creativity always comes as a surprise to right. us. And the heart of information theory is measuring the surprisal mm -hmm. in enterprise right. and entrepreneurship with the entropy calculations that define information as surprise mm -hmm. in networks. So, well, and so, so it's a it's a form it's a formal model in the sense that we can draw on Shannon's analysis. We can measure bits, right? Yeah, you can measure the amount of bits uh, uh, unusually. The information doesn't have weight or smell or yeah. you know. But or the volume, but information we is measured by the entropy equation, which yeah. which um, defines information as surprise, mm -hmm. essentially unexpected bits. But the difference and, and in... determined by freedom. In other words, the freer the entrepreneur was uh, in his creative yeah. 
domain, in other words, as freedom of the economy, mm -hmm. uh, determines the degrees of freedom and thus the possibility of surprisal. Yeah. So it, it directly links uh, information, mm -hmm. creativity, and entrepreneurship with su surprise and information. And uh, well, I, I, think, and I wonder if the question then is, there's a, it's a paradoxical type of model. You can have a physical model, right, in which you can predict exactly what an electron does within a sort of bounded probability where it's going to go. But um, an information theory model of capitalism, by definition, has to be sort of open-ended toward the future, right? Precisely because the entrepreneur, uh, we can't, there's no E variable. Right, that says, okay, this is where the, the innovation comes. It's, yeah. it's open ended. So, anything yeah. that's sort of appropriate to economic reality then is going to have to be open to the subject at the middle, which is the creative person who can't yeah, be predicted ahead of time. That's right. Yeah, which is a quite different yeah. sort of model than you're going to get in a, a sort of Newtonian right. frame. Right, absolutely. And Gregory Chaitin, yes. who invented algorithmic information mm -hmm. theory, um, has, has, uh, believes that the mathematics has to be uh, adapted to this new real condition of the universe, which is open to surprisal and yeah. creativity and new information, that the existing math is sterile mm -hmm. as a result of its exclusion of unexpected bits yeah. of surprisal. And so Gregory Chaitin is working on uh, not it, all the usual math yeah. is employed, sure. but it but it's a new math that he says comes after Kurt Gödel mm -hmm. and Alan Turing, who uh, r really were the founders of ultimate founders yeah. of information theory and uh, in in uh, Gödel incompleteness yes. and yeah. well and, and Turing. Turing's. Yeah, I mean, Turing himself had the category of an oracle, which yeah. is essentially a kind of stip. Okay, so yeah. the oracle's outside the system. Yeah. We stipulated he was. You have to have a creative force outside, outside the system. system. Yeah, it's absolutely crucial. Yeah. And so this is why, in some ways, the idea of a 19th century sort of mathematical model, it's like you're almost, no, that's not what we're talking about. We want yeah. it formalized, but yeah. we don't, it has to be open to the future yeah. and to that's innovation. True. And that's precisely. That's, Irritating if you're an economist because yeah. you can't predict that ahead of time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, let's see here if I can find that would be the answer. All right. So yeah. So the question is: Can can an entrepreneurial entropy be modeled in a mathematical model? That's the sort of yeah. That's, uh, uh, yes, it it can be modeled, and it's it's the creative. Creativity, the surprisal, the entropy in um, in information theory mm -hmm. is directly analogous to the creativity in entrepreneurial theory. Right, that's right. I mean, it's, computer programs require programmers. It doesn't mean that, <laughs> yeah, that that we, we can't measure the amount of number of bits in a software yeah, in a right. program. Yeah. yeah, this is, and in some ways, it's it's a measure after the fact. Right, we don't. You don't predict the innovative act ahead of time. You might be able to say, okay, under these conditions, uh, innovators will presumably create something. But yeah, we, right. you know, if we knew what it was, yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. We, we would have made the or the prediction would have been the innovation. Exactly. That yeah, yeah we'd have already solved the problem. Um, yeah. So so George, people want you to actually when you're answering, they're wanting to see your face actually look at this, and so. Um, I'm supposed to look at what? <laughs> they want you to look at the camera. And All right. Me, it looks like so. That was just as a request from the a request from the audience. So here's a great question: So how do you convince the public that information theory matters, uh, and that the existing approach to economics is too limited? It's a topic, um, you know, so that it's a you know, sort of generally kind of public. I mean, this is the difficulties explaining these things and translating these things. Well, into the I, public I think square. we're making dramatic progress. I mean, that it really has been adopted, believe it or not, very widely in China. Hmm. Uh, Life After Google was judged the most, the best social science book published in China last year. What do you account, how do you and, account for that? Well, it, it, I think they like the idea of a way of uh, explaining creative economics. So, so it, uh, but they grow 
in part in proportion to their freedom, mm -hmm. which uh, which defines the range of the entropic creativity. Mm -hmm. So, so it affirms freedom, and um, maybe just and, don't it, and it affirms a predictable rule of law because in order to have a high entropy, unpredictable, mm -hmm. creative um, message, you need to have a low entropy carrier. And the uh, law should be a low entropy right. carrier. And one of my critiques of the current US economy is the law has been rendered a high entropy, yeah. entrepreneurial, it's predatory. It's noise on the channel. It's Continual. noise on the channel. So. Yeah. So the law, rather than being a structure for enterprise, is an obscures enterprise, mm -hmm. it obfuscates enterprise with noise and predatory deep pockets mm -hmm. of pursuits. Well, with that uh, somewhat downer note, it's just yeah, a very yeah. beginning here, but it's also, I think, optimistic. We're going to take a short break, uh, and then we're going to hear from Discovery Institute fellow Chris Rufo about some of the oh, uh, boy, crazy yeah, that, stuff that's happening. That's the other side of wealth yeah. and poverty. I mean, poverty. It, there's the whole theory of poverty yes. in wealth and poverty. That's right. And okay. Chris Roos, Rufo is a, sp a splendid and a creative and inventive uh, exponent Absolutely. of the fundamental principles of the poverty. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're going to we're going to hear from our poverty experts. It's really thrilling to have. Chris, uh, really on board is. here. It is.